Good evening, and thanks for coming to our Langone series. I understand it's a little bit raining, so some people may still, no pun intended, dribble in. We're very, very fortunate to have Paula Kerger here as our guest this evening. She is the president and CEO, as all of you know from, I hope, having read the previous materials of PBS, which is the largest non-commercial media company in the United States. So I see the arts, I see news, I see public affairs, I see education, I see technology. And this is the lady who brings that all to us. I took a poll of my family this morning to start. It's actually quite interesting. I've, Irish have a very large family, as you can imagine. And I said three, three channels. PBS, the men all voted for ESPN <laughs> and HBO. And I said, well, if we could get that, life would be totally, perfectly happy, wouldn't it? And they all started laughing. As, as you think about that, let me start with a few questions for Paul. And what we are going to try to do over the course of the next hour is to cover three basic topics, and then we'll open it up to you, hopefully, without any problem for the last 15 minutes so that you can ask your questions. We would like to talk about PBS, we'd like to talk about Paula, and we'd like to talk about pointers for you, students of Stern. So with that as a lead-in, one of the things I find interesting about your organization is its mission. Tell us about mm -hmm. your mission. It's very different from a commercial, standard commercial TV. Right. So in order to answer that question, let me just talk for a couple minutes about um, how we were formed and actually how we're a little different than other international public broadcasters, probably the best known as the BBC or NHK. In, um, in, in the UK, for example, television was non-commercial, and then commercial television came later. Here in the States, it was the other way around. We started with commercial television, and it was actually the first female FCC commissioner, a woman by the name of Frida Hennick, who looked at this emerging technology and, and realized the power of, um, of television and the potential not just to entertain, but uh, when done at its highest purpose, could also educate and inspire. And so she lobbied very hard to have some spectrum put aside. About 10% of television spectrum was set aside for educational purposes, and that's how public media was formed. So um, to answer the question about mission, education is at the heart. Um, in fact, many of the stations around the country, their call letters have E's in them. In fact, the legal name for Channel 13 here is Educational Broadcasting Corporation, uh, W-N-E-T. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, so education is at the heart. The other is really market failure. And so I always hate to define ourselves by the negative, so I'll say opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we, um, from the very beginning when there were some networks and then the PBS, actually flash forward to today, even though there is a robust media landscape, there are still areas that commercial media, for whatever reason, is either unable uh, to take up. And so um, if you look at television right now, um, I'm answering a lot more, so no, you'll, no, ask three, you'll ask no, me three questions like and an we, hour later we, we we'll, like still, I'll still be that's talking. Not a, that's not a problem. But, um, if you look at television <laughs> today, um, you really have, uh, you know, really two extremes. You have, I think we're, we, you have a abundance of reality programs, 56% uh, of primetime programming right now reality shows, inexpensive to produce. Right. You can make your own decision about the value. And then on the other end, <laughs> we did a panel at Press Tour and someone was explaining what, how Kim Kardashian is really a great artist. Sometime I'll tell you about that. But then on the other side, on the other side, we are in an amazing era of great scripted drama. And I was talking to one of your colleagues here who is at HBO, and HBO obviously is leading the way. Cable actually is leading the way with a lot of great drama, and I'd like to think that we contribute to that with a few series like Sherlock and Downton Abbey and others. So, um, and there's been a lot of discussion recently about how many people, rather than working in film, are working in television. It's a place where you can, you, you know, you really see wonderfully, powerfully written stories, beautifully cast. Um, and that, I think, is, is sort of the environment we live in. What is missing, though, even with all these channels and all these opportunities, are some fairly big categories of content. History, hmm. uh, which was the domain of the History Channel, not so much anymore. Um, History Channel has moved in a slightly different direction. 
Um, and Ice Road Truckers is not Ken Burns. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's entertainment, and I think they've produced some great programming. So again, please no one leave the room or start tweeting that I'm trash talking our colleagues. We, we actually have Ice Road Truckers outside on the street on West yeah. 4th right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been slugging through New York all day today, so I'm thinking a lot about Ice Road Truckers. Anyway, um, and, and um, so that's missing arts. With the exception of the of the competition shows, uh, really, you know, I grew up at a time when uh, you could see uh, great art in many places on television, mm -hmm. including places like the Ed Sullivan Show. So yeah. you had, you know, you had Maria Callas, you had the ballet dance, you had the Beatles. There isn't a place for that anymore, in 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 a way that it once was. And I would also argue high quality educational content mm -hmm. for kids. Our kids' content is all curriculum based, and so our mission is to use the power of media, and that means television as well as all emerging technologies, to, um, to educate, inspire, and hopefully entertain. We're not spinach. We are a media company that is in the entertainment business, and so we do care about the entertainment factor. But what drives us is not necessarily trying to amass the largest number of eyeballs. It's really trying to help transform people's mm -hmm. lives with content that matters. We're going to come back to about five of the things you just talked about and hopefully do a little bit more deep dive Aren't on that. Aren't you glad I didn't have more coffee no, today? No, no, no. That was, that was <laughs> you're talking to a guy who had two boats named Type A. <laughs> so I totally identify with that. T tell, us, tell us what a membership organization is as opposed to, from a business model yeah. standpoint, as opposed to a corporation yeah, that we're so, normally used to. Yeah, so this is, is, this is what makes um, my life both exhilarating at times and extraordinarily frustrating at others. So we are a media company in a time which I think had a great competition. Um, but we are also a membership organization, which means that we have 350 stations around the country that are all independent. Uh, locally owned and operated, which is significant in an era when, frankly, in most parts of the country, when I visit our public stations, the public stations are the only remaining hmm. locally owned and operated. So I think there's public policy issues there, or at least uh, I think a, a, an, an interesting discussion we could have about the value of having a station that is controlled by people in the community. And those stations, in fact, created PBS. So we're the exact opposite of a network which is very, um, you know, sort of top-down controlled. We are grassroots, everything bubbles mm -hmm. up. Most of the content that comes to us comes to us through stations uh, that's produced and then uh, we um, uh, organize a schedule and we help distribute. It is, um, so for, if you're looking at it from an organizational structure perspective, in addition to the fact that we are a nonprofit uh, organization, we also are the kind of organization with distributed authority. So I have a lot of responsibility, but not full ultimate authority over what any station does. If you are a PBS station, you adhere to certain guidelines. And so there is, it's not as if everyone sort of goes off in their own direction and does what they want. But at the end of the day, to guide a, a company like this, you have to really work very hard at getting everyone rallied around a sense of common mm. purpose. Now, I would argue, as a business leader, the most effective corporate leaders are the ones that frankly do that as well. Mm -hmm. And if you have read uh, a lot of work of Jim Collins, I, I'm a big fan of, of some of his work. He wrote a book um, you know, that everyone remembers good to great, and then after that he wrote a monograph um, for the public sector where he really starts to drill down because after Good to Great was out and he was doing all his book tours and people, mm -hmm. you know, it sold gazillions of copies, people were reaching out to him that worked either in government service or worked in the nonprofit sector, really wondering whether some of his, um, some of his theories actually apply in those sectors as well. And he spends a lot of time really thinking about this whole idea of the leadership style of nonprofit leaders and particularly in organizations like mine where, um, um, and he looks at, at organizations that are led by people that have come out of the corporate sector that have, that have led with a, a strong fist. Most of those people are profoundly unsuccessful and they move into the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's, a, it's, it's really, for those of you that are studying management and really thinking about different management styles and structures, you know, ours is, is, is an interesting one to look at, but I think the nonprofit sector in general is interesting to look at as you, as you try to figure out how do you lead an organization, how do you get people you know, motivated to excel and, and do their best work. And it's not necessarily by beating people over the head 
uh, or really trying to uh, just point the organization in a direction and, and just assume everyone's going to follow you. You really do have to you know, sort of bring people along in, in the discussion. So that's what the membership piece means. I want to do a little bit more of that when we get to the Paula part. But before we get to the Paula part, help so me out. You're not going to be able to separate this oh, out. I'm weave it all together Remember, I teach this room a lot. I'm used to doing that. <laughs> Tell me about the PBS part. How did you do last year? How did we do in last In terms year? of the business, yeah. As a business, um, we've, we're actually in a pretty good run the last couple of years. Um, and in part uh, because um, I think um, we have stuck to our guide star in terms of the quality of the content that we're producing. So, you know, I think we're, again, where organizations sometimes get into, uh, you know, troubled water, mm -hmm. using your nautical analogy from before, is when they um, when when they sort of I was always there. Keep yeah, going. <laughs> mm -hmm. When they when they lose their um, their focus yeah. and are tempted to try to chase what appears to be successful for other organizations, we have a very clear path that we've tried to f to follow, and I think that has served us well. I think that with the market gaps created by the rest of the media landscape, that's also created opportunities for us. So I think the focus, the relentless focus on trying to create compelling content is important. Compelling content that's distinctive is important. And then I think also um, the fact that the markets have opened up. So, you know, for a period of time, you know, there were really great compelling, uh, I, I'm going to pick on History Channel again because it's just an obvious one, documentaries on history, mm -hmm. they're not there anymore. Mm -hmm. So if people are, are not interested in some of the fare there, they're, they're coming to us. So, so from a financial, st look, we're never a wash in cash, uh, but, um, but for the last, which I know is surprising to everyone here, but thanks to viewers like you, yeah. um, we, um, yeah. we've, we've had, the last couple of years have actually been pretty good for us. We're going to touch a little bit more on that too, but you touched on one that's a little out of order, but I'll ask it. How, how does the front line in a Downton Abbey come to you? How, how, do, how, does that, how does that get up to you in terms of something that you may want to put, put, on, put, on, put onto the system? Yeah, so um, we, work with, um, we work with producers, uh, many of whom are associated with stations. The two examples you gave are both uh, projects that come to us through WGBH in Boston, which mm -hmm. is the largest producer of WGBH and WNET are the two largest producers of, of uh, content for public broadcasting. Frontline has been a series that um, has been on the air for a number of years. Yeah. They organize their um, their schedule and and talk to us about the things that they're going to be covering. But they're as a as a news organization, they are not necessarily bringing us programs and saying, "Do you want this or that?" Masterpiece is a curated series uh, put together by Rebecca Eaton, who runs um, Masterpiece. And she scours um, and, and right now gets lots of scripts uh, that she waits through and she looks for programs that she thinks are going to be compelling. Actually, she and I were on a panel two days ago here and she talked sure. about how she makes the selection of what ends up in Masterpiece. So she's looking for well-written, compelling stories with characters that you care about. Um, those are sort of the, that's sort of at the, and frankly, um, that's how most, I think, really good programmers are making their program decisions. You really want to focus on characters that people care about. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I think that plays out everywhere. And so, and so they, she puts together a, a season, uh, makes some picks, tries to figure out what uh, she feels will fit for the series. And then we look at it together with mm -hmm. her and make the decision and we go. Um, a few years ago, we had an amazing season. Uh, we looked at um, bringing back Upstairs, Downstairs. That mm -hmm. was a series that had been one of the most popular on public television and the series that was the most requested from viewers that as it, when you asked, what series would you like to see come back? Down, upstairs, Downstairs, by far, top of the list. Um, we were aware of this wonderful new uh, Sherlock that had been done in the UK that looked really interesting mm -hmm. and engaging. Uh, with a then up and coming, now star, Benedict Cumberbatch. And then there was a program that my then head of content referred to as that Gosford Park thing, <laughs> which was uh, Julian Fellows who did Gosford <laughs> Park's um, idea of uh, bringing it back. And we actually almost passed on the series, which is why I'm telling you the story. Um, we almost passed on it because we were doing upstairs, downstairs, and it felt like a lot of very similar, there's yeah. a lot of overlap right. between the two. And, but, it, but they had already cast Maggie Smith. And so without seeing a lick of film and knowing um, 
what Julian had done with Gosford Park, we said yes, and how smart were we? Yeah. Because no one Brilliant. realized what a juggernaut Downton Abbey would be. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. The CEO of the organization, the, the, I mean, one of the most obvious questions is what, what are your challenges and, and where are the opportunities going forward in terms of you? Your, your business is changing at, at literally lot. at light speed. Yeah. yeah. So besides money, which is always, you know, again, the underfunded public broadcasting service, because um, we get about 15% of our funding from the federal government, by the way, 1-5, five, not 5-0. Five oh. And, um, and when you look at all the public broadcasters in the world, we're, we're almost at the very bottom in terms mm -hmm. of percentage of right. federal money. So we really, every year, have to raise most of the money that goes into public broadcasting. So viewers like you are extraordinarily valuable. That is where most of the money comes, and then we look for partnerships as well. Money is always, uh, you know, we're always mm -hmm. scrounging. Um, I would say the biggest challenge is also the biggest opportunity, which is the change in technology and the way that people are consuming content. I think it is hugely powerful when you think about what is going on in media right now. So you look at Netflix and House of Cards yep. and how I wonder how many people, you don't have to answer in this room, uh, spent Valentine's Day weekend, I hope with your loved one, watching as many <laughs> episodes of House of Cards as you could physically <laughs> stand to watch. Um, and then you have uh, a, a program like Downton Abbey, which is, although you can watch it in streaming form, you can watch it in, um, in lots of other places, people are still figuring out how to get home on Sunday nights at 9, yep. and remember this is the finale, Sunday night, uh, to watch <laughs> Downton Abbey. And so, in, and, and in fact, I, in the course of, these, of this last couple of years, I can't tell you how many people have told me that they organize little screening parties, some people come in costume. You know, it, it has become a phenomenon. So why do I mention that besides it feels like a fun little story? It's because I think as people are trying to figure out how people are consuming media, there is no linear path. There are hmm. lots of people that love to come home and flop down on their couch and turn on the television and have the serendipity of figuring out what's there. It's already been curated for them. There are people that have their favorites that they've got plugged in, that maybe they've DVR'd, or maybe they go onto Netflix to find. There are people that have um, devices like Roku and Apple. Um, some have many. And there are people that you know don't have televisions at all, um, are watching all their media through streaming form on their tablet, or their tablet was game changer, by the way, for media, as well as um, you know on their laptops or whatever. And I think for us, thinking about the fact that we can build something and it can connect to people so many different ways. When we look at the Nielsen ratings for Downton Abbey as an example, you know, the audience for the, the moment of the premiere is significant. But then if you look at the Nielsen plus seven ratings for the whole week, you see that you know, 25, 50% more people are coming in, so they're watching different plays. And then when you start to layer in all the other places, I think taking a lesson from the music industry that got this very wrong at the beginning, mm -hmm. um, gating everything off and making people come to you is a mistake. Trying to figure out where people are and making sure your content is there is the right thing to do. But it is complicated and it's not inexpensive because every platform, I'm sure this will surprise mm -hmm. you, every platform has different protocols of how it's built. So it's not just that sure. you beam it up somewhere and somewhere it, somehow it ends up everywhere. So everything, you know, we used to just beam a signal out and it would go out over the air. Most of the cable head ends would pick it up from there and so forth. No more. I mean, we're creating multiple copies of everything that we do. And so it makes the business that much more complex. But on the other hand, it's a great opportunity to build something Absolutely. and know that you can put it in all these places and someone maybe will be home at 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night to watch a program, or maybe they'll catch it at midnight when they happen to get home, or maybe they'll catch it a couple weeks mm -hmm. later because they've got it stored you know, on their iPad. So I think it, it just creates a big, bigger market for us, but it makes it more complicated in terms of trying to figure out both the business in terms of how to manage it, how to promote it and where things are, how to brand. Brand, I think, is tremendously important mm -hmm. in this kind of environment and then ultimately how to fund it. Yeah. So how do you actually count? Nielsen doesn't have a way to count you know, across all these different platforms. And so really figuring out how you aggregate all these numbers up so that you can tell a potential underwriter on a co commercial side, a potential advertiser, 
that a certain number of people are watching, it's, go it's going to be important to try to figure that piece out. T the, the component in your organization of, of technology experts must be going up dramatically because I, I know from my own grandchildren, I mean, I sit there and watch two and three year olds with their iPads watching Sesame Street and going through the screen yeah, faster yeah. than I can. And then I think about your business saying, how yeah. can you possibly stay ahead of yeah, that? Yeah, it's, it's hard to stay ahead. And, and, and you're right about kids. I mean, you know, we're producing uh, content. And in fact, I, I would say the most integrated of all the work we're doing is in the kids space. Mm -hmm. And kids from a, and, and our focus on kids is mostly, um, you know, pre-K. And they, and they can all um, operate, you know, smartphones. In fact, e you know, everybody has a story of the child that goes up to the TV screen and does this <laughs> because that's their, that's their view of the world. And yeah. so I think that, you know, the technology demands of the organization are significant. But, you know, looking at it again from an organizational dynamics perspective, it's a great opportunity because this, for us, is where we're bringing in a lot of younger people into sure. the company. Absolutely. And p places like PBS, people want to work there, and they, you know, they want to die there. It's hard to get people to move out. And so, um, <laughs> we love them. Everyone that stays forever. You should, um, you should work here, Paula. Yeah. But I, I have to watch what I say. Yeah. But <laughs> I, but I think the, these are areas where, you know, in those parts of our company, people that are working on game design, all that stuff. You tend, to, we tend to be bringing in a lot sure. of younger people. Well, that yeah. ties into a great next question, and that is, tell me about the nature of your audience. It used to be, uh, you know, m me over 30 and my parents, etc. Yeah. You, you have a legion of two and three year olds now we who have a really are big, totally loyal to yeah, PBS. Yeah, we have a very big audience under five, and we have a very big audience over 50. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a barbell, and in, in, in between we have a lot of people, but not at the scale of mm -hmm. both ends. And, um, you know, so y when you're an organization, you can't be all things to all people. So right. you, you make hard decisions. But I've always thought about the number of people that are in the middle of that barbell that would love the con some of the content that sure. we produce. I think this is where the new platforms are great. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have places like Xbox where we have content, you know, which appeals to a younger male audience. And so we think carefully about the content we put there. Science works really well. Um, we are producing um, native um, digital content, you know, particularly through YouTube, which uh, our online audience is under 35 average. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are, um, it depends, so when people ask who's your audience, I, I always say it depends. It depends yeah. on where you are. Right. Or what you you're know, using. And what you're using. Right. Yeah. Yeah. How, I, I, again, as the CEO, one of the great challenges from my old engineering background is the technology challenge of, of when do you go to the next platform. Do you find that a major challenge in your job with all the different technologies that are being developed? Do you, do you, are you conservative and you wait, or do you ever take risks yeah, we, and, we, and kind of bet on a technology? We spend a lot of time talking about risk, and we've been spending a lot of time recently talking about risk, to be, risk because one of the areas that I'm most focused on is for us to remain an innovative company. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the, the biggest areas where we have been uh, quite innovative have actually been in the technology area. We are the ones that created closed captioning. Uh, we're the first that used satellite distribution. We were one of the early companies that embraced um, high definition. We were the ones that actually made use of multicast. I think most broadcasters use their extra channels for like weather and traffic, and, mm -hmm. and we actually packaged and created whole channels. Um, we've been very early on, on a lot of the media platforms um, and, and to great success, uh, both in terms of the technology that we're building and some of the content. We actually won more Webby Awards this past year than anyone except Google. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, so you don't want to be so far out there yeah. that, you know, I mean, for us as a, as a nonprofit organization, oh, yeah, we can true. take risk, but right. we can't take crazy risk. Exactly right. So, you, I, but I always want to seed um, enough uh, resources into innovative proper, uh, projects that, and not describe innovation as just what those folks that um, work in the digital department are mm -hmm. doing. Innovation should really cascade across the company. But um, continue to put the resources into trying new things. I think, again, looking at this, and I know some of you are um, um, already in the, in the marketplace, hard at work, I think that the areas that are the, are the hardest for companies to really get their heads around is risk. Because every company says, oh yeah, we want to be a company of, of right. innovative thinkers and so forth, and then their business practices, particularly their management practices, don't reflect that. So someone messes up and you know, they feel like they're going to lose their job is not necessarily going to engender um, a lot of confidence in taking risk. And so we've been spending a lot of time, actually 
following the lead of our uh, former head of digital who wrote an article last year, I guess it was, for the Harvard Business Report about how he managed risk and encouraged risk within his department, which is he put into the employee metrics mm -hmm. um, that, that as part of employees' evaluations, they had to demonstrate their, um, a certain amount of failure. So that, yeah, in fact, sure. um, it, the, that kind of risk was rewarded. So, I mean, you, you, the, the point of it is not to just fail for failure's sake, but to fail, fail fast in, in, the, in the digital parlance but also to learn from it. And you know, since so much of the work in the digital space is iterative anyway, right. you know, the, whole, the whole development cycle is very different than television. You embark in a project, you um, launch it before it's perfect, which kills the television people. And then, um, and then you just keep shifting it and, and shifting it and evolving it. That in our organization has been one of the toughest things because we've, we're a culture of, sure. uh, of television where everything, and, and we're public television for gosh sakes, so everything has to be just absolutely perfect because people expect the highest standards mm -hmm. and quality. And how you, how you reconcile that against the digital side of the house that is you know, willing to just put something up that sort of looks right and see what happens mm -hmm. is, a, is a really interesting sure, environment. Yeah, I would, I would think so, yeah. The economy overall is starting to improve. How does that affect your, your contribution rate? I presume it, the it, obvious it is it should us, go up. It affects us on all levels. So yes, so uh, regardless of real income or not, perceive, per perception in, the, in philanthropy matters. So if people feel comfortable, if they feel that the world isn't going off a cliff, right. if they feel more positive about their own economic fortunes, mm -hmm. they tend to be more generous in right. their philanthropy. So, um, so that's important. I think that um, you know we've gone through a period where companies have have had cut back on some of their marketing dollars, mm -hmm. and so as the economy improves and people are are um, building you know new product and mm -hmm. new efforts out, I think that flows. I think that um, the overall economy improving and in, in, um, also takes some of the pressure off of um, both state and federal governments mm -hmm. um, and their funding streams, right. of which some of our stations get state money as well as, uh, you know, we have a federal budget this year, so we will be funded this year. So it's it, it just takes a lot of the doubt out. And then improvement in the, um, in the economy um, and particularly improvement in the market yeah. improves the value of foundations. And so, you know, when the economy, you know, uh, went down, a lot of the values right. of endowments went down. And so foundations were, you know, not all, some actually dipped into their principal, but a lot of foundations were spending less. So, you know, it became a perfect storm with mm -hmm. pressure all the way around. Mm -hmm. if, if they ever unbundled cable, I, I would presume that that would help you dramatically in terms of people contributing more to your, your, if they your like cable, the way I started. It, I mean, I, I well, would, $200 a month for cable and, you know, you have to kind of beat people over the head to send you a check, let's say, yeah. for $10 a month. That's, yeah, I always I, think I, if they ever unbundled cable, that yeah. would, that would be one of the best things for you. I hadn't actually thought about it from that you. perspective. I, um, I, you know, if they ever unbundle cable, which, I mean, we, I don't know, I don't know whether that will happen or not. Um, you know, some of our stations would actually be challenged because we have markets where we have multiple stations and they might not all end up getting carried in, yeah. a, in an unbundled environment. Uh, but I think, that, um, I think that people now are paying more and more attention to the fact that suddenly their cable bills are, you know, fairly significant. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, and so you have, um, you know, and, and I think people are thinking very carefully about what the offerings are. And so, um, you know, you, you do have a lot of people who um, have made the decision that, you know, actually have gone back to over-the-air television for some of the mm -hmm. more breaking news kind of thing, but get most of their media from a combination of uh, online streaming and, and right. sources like Netflix yeah. and, and, you know, and others. So I, I think it's a... I think that's why, you know, from our perspective, I want to be everywhere because, yeah. you know, whether um, cable, how the strength of cable, the strength of uh, satellite, the strength of streaming, the strength of all these over the tops. It's not clear to me who will who will be the the leader at the end of the day, or whether you know the environment is just you know permanently shifted, and and you just need to be in all those spaces. Yeah, I, I would forward. agree with that. I mean, we could have buggy whip companies, let's say, for the major networks at some yeah. point in life, at least in one scenario. Huh? Yeah, but you know, I'll tell you, um, you know, according to Nielsen, people are watching more 
linear television, not streaming, more linear television than any time in history. It hmm. seems unbelievable. Yeah. You know, media consumption just continues to expand. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it, it is very much a, uh, an unknown. And I think for people that are running organizations, whether they're commercial or non-commercial, you, you really have to look at all these various pieces and try to lay it out when you're building your strategies mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah. You obviously love the business. You're great at the business. How did you get into the business? Into this business? Yes. Um, you know, like everyone else, and I, I, I think, um, or most other people, I, um, when I was in college, I, I felt like a chronic underachiever because I had started out in med school and hit <laughs> organic chemistry, and that was the end of med school. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then took a lot of arts classes, and which I loved, and realized I would never be gainfully employed and could never leave home. And so I got a degree in business, mm -hmm. and, but with no clear idea of what I wanted to do with it. I was really interested in marketing, but I, I really, and I was really interested in international marketing, as a matter of fact, but I, I, I didn't have a clear idea. I, I um, accidentally ended up working in the nonprofit sector. I got a job mm -hmm. working for UNICEF in Washington. And, uh, and so I've stayed in the nonprofit sector my whole life. The company I run now, is more uh, is more like a business, except our shareholder happens to be on Main Street, not necessarily on mm -hmm. Wall Street. Uh, but you know, we're running a half a billion dollar company, and it is one that um, needs to break even. Mm -hmm. And which I'm proud that in the eight years that I've been running PBS, we've operated in the black every year. It is a complex media organization, and it is one. But it is one that has a double bottom line. So. I need to run an organization that is spinning off, an, off enough resources that I can invest in new content and that is operating on a solid foundation, but I also have this other purpose, which mm -hmm. is the mission we right. talked about before. And being able to uh, navigate through both is something that, from my perspective, is, uh, is tremendously in interesting. So mm -hmm. I say that I, you know, I accidentally came into this. Uh, my, f my grandfather founded the public radio station in Baltimore. So I think it's at some, some part maybe buried in my DNA yeah, somewhere. It's in it was there. a, it's was in a the genes. real calling to, uh, to work in media, but I had no, um, I had no real uh, goal to end up in media. I just, you know, it, it's just, uh, it just well, happened. You, you picked, you, sometimes luck is more important than anything. You picked yeah. the right area. How would you describe your management style? We always like to hear that from our CEOs. Yeah, I would say, um, I think, I, I would say a few things about the way that I manage, and I have a colleague sitting here so she can, you know, uh, <laughs> if she's rolling her eyes and you know I'm, I'm like making stuff up. But I, I think that you hire the best people that you can find. You, you, you hire people yeah. that are smarter than you. Right. And you get out of the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's really important for a leader to, um, help uh, work with a team in, in articulating a very clear strategic direction and a solid you know, business plan and obviously the budget that goes alongside of that. I think it's up to a leader to um, clear the decks so that when mm -hmm. there are obstacles that you know, s the team can succeed. I think that um, a, a leader should um, inspire um, and work alongside the team, but um, at least this is how I've tried to manage mm -hmm. and, and be engaged and particularly mentoring um, um, the team, but I, I am not a micromanager. I don't dive in. There are things that I would do very differently than some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. and sometimes I think that's the hardest thing is to really step back and, and let people build something out in, in the way that I was just going to say that the, the delegating and the trust is, is a yeah. very <laughs> difficult skill set yeah. to learn. Yeah, and, and delegating, but not being absent, which right. I think is a balance that some exactly people right. have tr right. difficulty striking, because delegating doesn't mean patting someone on the head and saying, okay, we've got our plan, go, you know, go do the Lord's work and come back and let me know how it works out. You know, I think you, have to, you do have to stay actively engaged and mm -hmm. you have to be constantly looking for um, how you need to, we, we manage our organization dynamically. We are constantly looking for how we may need to pivot and change mm -hmm. and move um, and I think that you have to stay very close to the business in order to do that. You have to listen really carefully. Right. You have to be really in touch with um, um, your customers, and I'm, I spend a lot of time outside. So 
part of what I hope that I'm also doing in the organization is is, is being a little bit of that bridge and mm -hmm. you know looking at, you know particularly in our relationship with our member stations. Sure, the feedback what must they be very need, important. You yeah. know what they're what they're worried about, what they're paranoid about, and uh, and and keeping everything moving in a, in a good direction. What what do you? Well, let me phrase it differently. One of the things I always encourage my students, having worked for many many years, is you have to have something besides just work. Obviously, family. Oh, yeah. it, but I, I feel really strongly about that. What do you do when you're not working? Yeah, I. What, uh, what are your What are your hobbies? What yeah. are your interests? Yeah, <laughs> she's laughing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, a few years ago, I, I uh, started participating in triathlons. So I, because I think that it's really important to. I, I think it's really important in organizations to have uh, balance, and and we spend a lot of time thinking about what we need to be doing as a company to ensure that we're the best company. Because mm -hmm. I can't always afford to pay people the most amount of money, but mm -hmm. I can create an environment where people can have a life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so by the way, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go work in the nonprofit sector because it'll be easier. E these are not easy jobs, let me tell you. Sometimes I think people work harder in our sector yeah. than they do in the corporate sector. But we work with um, our employees to make sure that um, they have time to be with their families and to take care of issues with their families. Uh, we encourage people to take vacation and that we don't look funny at people that actually want to do that. You know? <laughs> um, we encourage people to actually go home at night and, uh, and come in the morning refreshed and to be engaged in their community. And I think all of those pieces are tremendously important. And then, you know, from my perspective, I think the physical health p part was, I mean, because these are, these are, you know, I think many of you are, are, I'm sure, involved in jobs that are hugely stressful, and you have to have outlets. So you have to right. have, you have sure. to have a support network. So you have to have family and friends that are part of your life. Um, you have to have, you know, um, I think a physical outlet because I think you have to keep yourself physically strong in mm -hmm. order to run a company. Yep. And then I think you also, I think we all are members of communities, and we have to be part of those communities. You have to pay back. Um, so this was my speech to the Stern School graduates this past June. Mm -hmm. I think all of those are pieces of a, of a well-lived life. And I think you don't put it off and decide, well, you know, I'll, I'll do this and this now and I'll get to the other part, you know, when I have exactly some time. Right. You, you map it out and it just doesn't happen by serendipity. You really have to make it work. I was horrified uh, a year or so ago, I was on a panel with a bunch of women who were CEOs in Washington and one said, well, you know, when I became a CEO, I knew that was the end of all my working out and that was the end of my community service. And I was like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you really do need to lead by example. Right. And I, you know, and, and so we work really hard at trying to encourage our employees to, you know, share those same values. Yeah, which is, needless to say, extraordinarily important. A balanced life is one of the major topics the students are always talking about. How do you do it? Yeah. So that's important to hear. Let's go to the management side now. When, when you're looking for, you know, your future managers, what, what are you looking for? Intellectual curiosity, um, people that have passion and energy, mm -hmm. uh, people that are willing to take risk, um, that are um, collaborative. Um, you know, I'll take a risk on someone that maybe doesn't have all the experience yeah, that you right. might think. Good for a job, but that is willing to um, really put themselves out there. Those are the best managers that I, mm -hmm. you know, that I, that I bring in. Yeah, and it's okay to fail is one of the things I want to really communicate okay to. to. Fail. Fa failure is part of, of getting ahead. Yeah, failure is part of getting ahead. And then, um, but it's also, um, it's great for me to say that, but I, you know, we also have to make sure that all the managers that are working around us, you know, uh, follow the same uh, ideals because the worst thing in the world Absolutely. is to encourage someone to put themselves out there working for a manager who is ready to throw you under the bus at you know the wrong moment. So, so, so from your standpoint, a consistent set of values that are readily identifiable is extraordinarily yeah. important to yeah, the company. We're, we're actually right now working on um, you know within our company as part of uh, we're just refreshing our strategic plan. We have a three-year. Uh, we were just coming off of a three-year plan and and we're looking towards the next three years. And I think for a company like ours, three years, I mean, to look further than that, people always say, what do you think the yeah, future is gonna look like? Who sure. knows, who right. knows? Uh, for most companies, I mean, what's the future gonna look like? You know, everything is shifting fast. Media is not different right. than a lot of other industries. But I think you, you can look forward and, and make some good guesses. And uh, three years ago, we made some good guesses. So our three-year plan for the next um, period is, is gonna be similar to what we've done with some tweaks. Um, 
But alongside of that, you know, we're really looking at, you know, what are our values as a company? Mm -hmm. What do we stand for? What do we aspire to be? Um, and, and, you know, how do we look at ourselves? How do we look at the world? How do we make business decisions based on, on that? And also then how do we treat each other? How do we treat our, um, you know, our stations? How do we treat our vendors? How do we treat, you know, everyone else around us? And, and I think that's part of, you know, building a company that, you know, really has some cohesion. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Before I turn it over to you, the audience, can you give me two or three pieces of advice you might give them as, as Stern students? As Stern students, I would say, well, my, you know, you, you hit one, which is, you know, sort of the whole life thing. The second is, um, I'll give you three, um, is, uh, so that was one. Uh, number two is, I always encourage people to look for mentors, and then oh. I always encourage people to mentor people coming up. And as Stern students, you should be doing it as well. Um, there are people coming behind you that are trying to figure out their life's path, and you can decide whether the one you're on is working for you, but you're learning stuff as you go, and y you got to help bring people along. And I think that with mentors, it's really important. I, I still look for people to help me. Mm -hmm. I'm a first-time CEO, and these jobs can be really lonely. I mean, who do you turn to? You know, when you work in a company, you got colleagues across the place. Suddenly, you're in that office, and you can't necessarily walk down the hall and, you know, ask someone something that you would have had you been in another role in the company. I have a woman who is uh, our, uh, was our vice chair of the board, uh, was the f first woman president of, of UNC. She's an amazing woman. And I've had a couple of circumstances over the last couple of years where I really needed, um, you know, someone's help and guidance. And so it is, you know, I think there is never a place in your life where a mentor right. is not mm -hmm. helpful. And, I, and, and, and then I, I would say the third thing is, and I touched on this before, is um, leave yourself open to possibilities and be willing awesome. uh, on occasion to jump out of the airplane. Uh, if you map out a path for yourself and you think you have your life figured out, you're selling yourself short. And if you find yourself stuck somewhere and you're you know, unhappy and you can't quite figure it out, chances are you're trying to take the safe route. And just recognize that occasionally jumping out of the airplane means <laughs> that you may not be going in an upward direction. Sometimes you move, you move sideways. Sometimes you actually Go can take a step back. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're putting yourself in a place that feels way outside your comfort zone. Um, I, um, when I t took my, the job at Channel 13, um, I, fairly early in the job, the uh, then president asked me to do something on air, and um, I can't even tell you what that experience was like. It was an out-of-body experience. I know someone put a mic on me, and I know I talked, and afterwards, I did look at the tape, and it looked okay, but I can't even, I couldn't even huh? remember it. It was almost like I blacked out. It was the weirdest <laughs> experience. It was so painful, I can't even tell you. It is probably the most important skill that I picked up in that job for mm -hmm. this one, because I do a huge amount of sure. media and public speaking. And it's so, I, you know, and you know, he's, he asked me to do it. My first, my first gut instinct was no, I'm not gonna do it. And someone had told me uh, a number of years before is even if you think that it's gonna be so bad, at least give something a try before try. you say no. Right, So exactly right. Well, if you could ever teach me to speak like Philippe de Montebello, I would be the happiest person on the face of the earth. He's my hero. We open it up to you, please. So while you're an answering, the other thing is find your own voice, too. So, um, and I say that particularly for women. I think a lot of women go into the, into the workforce and they feel like they have to, they have to model themselves after someone right. else. Right, exactly right. Don't do that. Find, find yourself, find your authentic voice and use it. Hi, my name is uh, L. People Smith, and I work for Goldman. Um, in our company, culture is is a really big thing. And uh, you talk about, I can kind of relate to you talk about everybody very close, love the place they work. But you'd mentioned you have 500 different offices. And uh, how do you keep the culture preserved when they sort of so spread out and somewhat independent of each other? I would say that um, that is really complex. We have, uh, we have um, our main offices in um, the lovely town of Crystal City, which I refer to as Oz. It's really, it's right adjacent to the airport in, in Washington. <coughs> and then we have all of our satellite and um, 
our satellite center, which is literally satellites, is, uh, is down in Springfield, Virginia, and then we've got stations all over the country. Mm -hmm. Communication is really big. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about um, how we talk about the culture and who we are um, and how we communicate that out. So with our stations, you know, we do have uh, meetings. We, d we have a few meetings throughout the year. We have a big annual meeting where a lot of people come in, but not everyone. You know, same as with Goldman, not mm -hmm. everyone can come to one big place. And uh, so we, um, we try to, um, you know, reach out to those that will carry the message back. We do a lot with webinar. We do a lot using technology because that is a way, you know, through teleconference, Skype, everything else, which you can try to bring people together. But I think the consistency of trying to define who you are for a company is really important. And, and that's, again, where this whole values idea came to. Because you can let it sort of evolve, but I think if you can, you know, sort of rally behind a few key principles mm. and make sure that everything you're doing reflects that, I think it doesn't matter if you have one office or a hundred offices, if everyone in the company understands what the what Gulpin stands for, what PBS stands for, anyone else, it just it, it, it does permeate through the company. Mm -hmm. Oh, you get to pick, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you can pick. It's a reflex from you being in this room <laughs> teaching. <laughs> Um, two questions. So the first was, what was the reaction within the organization when Mitt Romney made the Big Bird comment um, during the debates? <laughs> and and uh, the other question is just about the channels for for new content. I mean, if you could just describe, um, you know, concept to yeah. getting in the door at something like PBS. Yeah. Great so um, starting with Mitt Romney, I'll come back to my. Um, I'll come back to my Jim Collins reference from earlier. So in his latest book, I feel like I'm shilling for him. Yeah. Um, so, um, and I don't agree with everything that he writes about either, but I think he, he I think just from a philosophical standpoint, I think it, he just he just has a, a interesting take on, uh, on management and, and the dynamic within companies. Um, but he talks about, uh, he talks about one of the defining attributes of companies that are successful is ones that understand how to take advantage of luck. And what he means is both good luck and bad luck. Mm -hmm. And so last year was, we had both. Uh, the good luck was obviously Downton Abbey to have a program that breaks through, you know, sort of the cultural um, swirl in a way that Downton has has been great because it's brought so many people back to PBS that, you know, perhaps haven't been in a while and it's just been terrific. Uh, the bad luck was the Mitt Romney moment. And um, I was literally sitting on the sofa in my uh, living room and literally fell off the sofa. I just couldn't, you know, I just couldn't even imagine that somehow we were in the middle of a presidential debate, which is not a place that you want to be. And um, the real risk, to be honest with you, wasn't so much the comment. And at that moment, it became the most tweeted political moment. Now, there have been many political moment since, but it was just, it wasn't just the statement, it was the fact that it immediately exploded in social media, which you, yeah. could, you could watch right. happening. Sure. And so you realized it was going to be significant, and the, the challenge of it was, first, really? And then the second part was <laughs> um, to not get to not get sucked into an election, which is where we should, yeah, we, sure. we, we couldn't be. And that was the hardest piece. And again, coming back to the values piece, and we have a lot of stations, and they all have perspectives, and they all have transmitters. And, uh, you know, um, and I can't tell them all what to say and do. But what we could do is look at the situation and say, we're not part of this discussion. But what we can do is be really clear on who we are and what we are and communicate that out and use it as a moment. And so that's what we chose to do. And I think it helped us a lot because when, you know, after the election, when, um, and at the moment it didn't feel like a good thing, let me tell you, but at the, um, at the, at, after the election when government tried to come back and look at the budgets, everything got put on the table and I feel like our issue had already been out there and it had been part of public mm -hmm. debate by itself. Mm -hmm. And the reaction, um, and you know, I, I would love to tell you that in public media we're just so brilliant in how we do all of our Hill representation. It's not us, it's people around the country who say, wait a minute, really? Right. You know, and so I think that was that moment. 
How do you get a program onto PBS? Um, I think was the second question. There are many routes in, and if you're really interested in producing for us, you can go on our website and there's there's information. But um, a lot of programming comes into us through stations. So you know, people get develop relationships with their local PBS stations, and and particularly in this market, you know, WNET does produce a lot of programming for us nationally. So programs come in that way. Um, we, have an, we have an open acceptance policy, so we get a lot of things that come in over the transom, and uh, we find great stuff there. Um, it's not, uh, we have uh, people that screen through product uh, program ideas. Most of the stuff comes to us um, um, after someone has done some work on it. Um, sometimes we get programs that are almost finished. Other times we'll get ideas and, and on some occasion, we'll put some money into something to get it at least to the next stage, mm -hmm. and uh, then we'll make a decision whether we want to invest more. Sometimes if we really like an idea, we'll give, and in fact, many times if we like an idea, we'll give the filmmaker a letter saying that, you know, we're interested in this project. Then they can take that out and raise money around yeah. it, so mm -hmm. it, you know, it gives them a way to, you know, try to, uh, to raise money. What's interesting now are the number of people that are coming into our orbit through YouTube. So Digital Studios, which was referenced in the film, is, is, is a evolving and increasingly important way that we're developing content for uh, people that really are interested in that YouTube space. Some of the stuff looks like, um, it looks very YouTube, would never evolve into a television um, project. There's one now up that's um, called Not Really, not necessarily the news, which is a everything but the news, but the news yeah. <laughs> which uh, just went up last week, which is a, a spoof on the news hour, and um, and the guy that did it, I know, really wants to do something for television. You know, so you look at something like that, and you can see where he's trying something out. We we have a kids program, uh, Word Girl, that started as an online project and then evolved into a weekly series, and now is a, is a daily. I mean, is a daily series. So you know, stuff has come to us mm -hmm. through that way. So that actually is a way where people have started to put their work in front of this in a manner that's much cheaper than building a whole TV sure. show. <coughs> Here. Um, thank you again for your time tonight. Um, two things. One, as a fellow business professional that also does triathlons, would love to hear more about that experience offline. But for the broader room, um, you talked a lot about advice, but I'm wondering what type of challenges do you think face us as emerging business leaders um, coming out into the business community? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Yeah, great question. I think that um, the pace of change is uh, is one that we all have to figure out how to navigate. Um, even under the best of circumstances, I think as as humans, we sometimes have trouble embracing change, and that I think is the new norm. And so, figuring out how um, organizations uh, can become flexible and remain flexible, but at the same time not zigzagging all over the place. I think is a mm -hmm. is a real is a real issue. I think that um, talent for the future. I'm uh, you know we as an organization are very interested in education. I gave you my education speech at the front end, um, but there are I mean you know we are a country desperate in need in, of engineers and mm -hmm. of very specific labor. And so I think for someone that's coming out as an emerging leader, I think ensuring that we have a educated uh, citizenry that are, that are prepared to take the jobs of the future, I think is going to be increasingly important. And I think the, you know, the global economy, um, you know, I think oftentimes, um, you know, we tend to, you know, forget who the true competition is. We, uh, we, op we operate in a global economy. and. We need to pay attention to that, and um, I think not all businesses really evolve in that direction, and uh, so I think that's also going to be, um, you know, really important. Yeah, Pace of technology, you know, is blinding, and uh, un unbelievable, absolutely. Un one of the examples I always give in class, and half of them will laugh when I say this, is I took all my engineering exams on a slide rule which was made out of balsa wood. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Think my, about it. Mine wasn't made out of balsa wood, but yeah. I had one. It was. I think it was made out of. Yeah, that's when I was failing but on organic this chemistry. Of but yeah. Hold on. yeah. I agree with yeah. your organic chemistry. In, in the back first, and then in front of you, in the, <laughs> with a purple top. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Who else was before her? You. You all figure it out. You figure out who's going <laughs> to ask the question. Right? I was looking this way. I couldn't tell. Go ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Liliana, and. Um, I'm a manager, and I dare say that I have the qualifications that you listed. 
my struggle is that with that said comes a type of personality that sometimes comes out very strongly out and I am having a hard time believing in myself sometimes when I switch cultures and sometimes the culture kind of doesn't fit with my personality mm -hmm. and I don't know how to be that flexible to to be successful in different organizations. Sure. Yeah, that's a really great question. I don't know how to do help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe s someone else in the room might be able to answer that question. You do have to pay attention to the culture of your organization, right. and that is, the fact that you're aware is a really good thing, because uh, I see people that just seem to be completely tone deaf to the culture of the organization. And I think oftentimes in life, this is personally, is certainly professionally, that our greatest weaknesses are sometimes overworking our greatest strengths. And so what has worked in, a, in an old organization that has allowed you to be tremendously successful, you then take to the next organization because that's gonna work for you again, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't always pan out that way. So I think that I, it, what I would suggest for you, my friend, is to look uh, within the organization as you're, you know, uh, as you're coming into a new culture, one is you really need to listen and listen carefully and watch. Watch the dynamic within the organization. Look within the organization of who's getting stuff done and how it gets done. I think you can take a lot of cues there. And I think it would be good to look for some uh, support uh, within the organization. Look at who's been successful mm -hmm. at navigating something and become their friend um, or mentor. mentor. Yeah. Or mentor. You know, because um, I think that will help you, you know, begin to navigate. Because I think sometimes um, you, um, you know, organizations have their own rhythm, and there are people that really figure it out and figure out how to work it well. And you can learn so much, uh, uh, you know, by trying to absorb that. And I'm not suggesting that you become a, a, a parrot of what someone who has figured it out, but you can internalize that and make it work for you in your own way. And encourage people to give you honest feedback around you. That's very important. Yeah. You know, because sometimes you come on strong and you don't realize it, and everybody turns you off. And I think that if you're really focused on trying to, uh, you know, ease up a little bit, um, just have people call you on it. D d don't ask them all to call you on it, but just ha you know, <laughs> get someone that you know that will be honest with you. You know, and when they give you feedback, take it well. You know. My name is Hemant. I'm an engineer turned finance professional. And I think the reason I did that because engineering doesn't pay much. <laughs> uh, but I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, given the technology, uh, do you now look at, look at the company as a global company? Do you think of getting revenues from outside US? The second question is, sometimes it's difficult to know what is the right thing to do. And sometimes the right thing may not be legal. How do you, as a person... Sometimes the right thing is what? The right thing to do may not be legal. Yeah, so may not be legal. As a person and as an organization, how do you deal with that? Yeah, okay. So um, you, you just made me forget your first question. Your first question is about... global. Oh, global. Yes. How important yes. is global? We, um, we are... Um, uh, we are a global company um, on, on several levels. We actually launched a channel in the UK uh, two years ago. It has bugged me tremendously that, you know, some of our greatest exports are, you know, actually for many years the, our greatest uh, cultural export was Baywatch. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and I, you know, I look at all the programming that we produce and it, it speaks to who we are as Americans. And so, you know, I, and, I, and I also think that for us, uh, we have a lot of international partners, and that for us to really be taken serious as an international partner, we needed to have a greater international presence, and so packaging a channel in the UK was a first step in doing that. We do a lot of international co-production, so we're a global um, company in that respect. The web has made us more of a global company. So we are involved in a, in a number of, of true educational projects, including one called Learning Media, which is a way of distributing educational content into schools via broadband. Um, a lot of our kids' content, I can tell you through IP addresses, I know is being used um, outside of the States. I think actually about a third of our audience, right? Is it about a third? I, I, is, is being used outside of the United States. So we're, whether we, by design or not, we're a global company. So I think it's, it's harder for, um, 
In terms of, of look, I, I think that, you know, looking at it from my perspective, um, I, I believe that you, we have to operate as an ethical company. We have to operate as a transparent company. There is nothing that I, I try to, to when we make decisions and, and when we do various activities, even when I'm putting things in writing, particularly in places like email, this is a, another big piece of advice. Please never put anything in email that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the New York Times. Um, nothing disappears. It's there right. forever. It swirls around. And I think the same goes through, through activities. You know, if you think no one's going to find out, not in the world we're living in now. Mm. And so um, if you, if, you know, from my perspective, if, if for us, uh, we try to operate with as much transparency. Now, you know, we're, uh, we were just in a back and forth with a reporter who thinks everything we do should be completely transparent. We're also competitive, so I'm not going to publish the contracts that we sign with all of our producers and just put it out there so people can look at and figure out and then go copy. But, um, but I do think that there is a level of transparency that is a little different for us that we need to meet. So I think if your gut tells you that you're doing something that's not right, God, go with your gut. You know, right. there's, you know, I, and you know, Malcolm Gladwell's book on, on, on uh, Blink is, it's, it's not just, um, you know, just instinct. It's all based on all the learnings and knowledge that you have. You know in your heart. Yep. You know in your heart when you're starting to hire someone that you're hiring the wrong person, right? And how many times have you done that? And then, you've, and then, you know, a year later, you realize, damn, why did I hire that person? I knew it was the wrong person to hire. But you, you let your head sort of talk you out of it. You've got to go with your gut. Okay, behind you with the pink shirt. Yeah, what we'll do is th this will be the last one in here. Paula has been nice enough to join us downstairs in the Commons for a while, so you can ask questions down there also. So why don't we take this one, and then we'll all move downstairs. Okay, my question was actually a little similar, but um, my name's Sarah. I am the social media manager at the Wall Street Journal, but I worked at HBO for five years before that with Josh, who you spoke to before this. And what I find interesting is that your offices are in Crystal City, but a lot of your programming right now that is the most popular is British. And you sort of just spoke to that, but as you were talking about changes and adapting to your culture and thinking internationally, I was just wondering how it came to be that Downton came to you um, and how you made the decision to um, keep that show and then what other markets you're really thinking about getting into next? Yeah, those are all great questions. So um, a lot of our drama is British because that's how we're able to afford to do it because we do our dramas with co-producers. So we're not funding all of Downton Abbey, we're just a partial funder and that's how we're able to uh, do programs like that. That is not to say that we would never do American drama, and uh, I'm actually hopeful in the next uh, cu um, couple years that we may at least take one foray into American drama. Um, it's, just, it's just a bigger investment for us, and so we're able to better leverage our resources by you know, pairing up with uh, uh, co-production partners, and, and most of the ones that we work with in drama tend to be in the UK. Mm -hmm. So we work with the BBC, we work with uh, uh, Channel 4, and we work with ITV, which is actually where Downton mm -hmm. came from. Um, but most of the other productions we do are actually American productions. And, um, and I think that um, when I, what was the second part of the question after that of, of um, you first asked about the, what, about the British. Yeah, and then what um, international markets you're thinking about. Right. Oh, and what international markets. So it was easy for us to do the UK because it's English. And so, um, you know, so I think that um, the UK experience has been an interesting one. Um, I, you know, we jumped into it because we had someone that was willing to put up the investment money for us to do it. And, um, and it was someone who, um, you know, every once in a while these beautiful things happen. And this guy had grown up in, Canada and watched a lot of PBS because we actually have a very large audience in, in Canada and um, and put up the money so that we could launch the channel. It is very hard to launch a standalone channel anywhere, but particularly mm -hmm. in the UK. And so it's we've had some success and and we've had some interest from other um, from other places um, about expanding upon that. Uh, we sell a lot of our work internationally uh, anyway. Um, and not just in, in, in co countries where English is, uh, you know, some stuff we've done in Spanish and we've dubbed other things and, and so forth. So I, you know, I don't know the answer to it yet. This is just a noble experiment thus far that, you know, but, you know, the channel continues to grow. So I think we probably will try to expand a bit 
on it. Um, I have to be really careful because the focus of our work really does need to be in the United States. I have my own reasons that I think uh, many agree are, are good ones to try to have more of an international presence. Um, so I'm hoping in the next few years we'll be able to do a little bit more. But being able to have packaged this channel, we, we are definitely getting more attention than having just you know, sold stuff off, you know, one-offs. Mm -hmm. Paul, on behalf of the students, and obviously Stern, we thank you not only for your time, but your wisdom. And hopefully everyone will be able to join us downstairs in the Commons for a little reception where, as I say, she's been kind enough to also answer some of your questions. Thank you very, great. very Thanks. much. Thanks, it was fun. That was great. Thank you, good question. Mm -hmm. Great session.